All right, welcome in. Late Kick is live. Finally, Sunday night, September 26th, the year of our Lord, 2021. Jam-packed as jam-packed can possibly be. We have got yet another Saturday in the rear view that they told you, hashtag the casuals told you, would be one that you could kind of bypass. You kind of take the bypass right around week four. Well, false. Total fake news. We had chaos from really dawn until well past dark. I was up in a hotel room in the wee hours of the morning trying to see if Colorado could hang with Arizona State. Uh, much to our chagrin, they could not. But, man, we have got a wall-to-wall -wall show tonight. Arkansas over a and That's the game that we were there for in Dallas. I have got a lot of stories and details for you from that one, believe me. Notre Dame over Wisconsin. Down goes North Carolina. Down goes Clemson. Down goes Iowa State. Uh, Texas rolls. Oklahoma survives but wins. The Sooners, I don't know if you realize this, they are 4-0. They are undefeated. Uh, the Big 12 picture, though, very cloudy. I landed in Nashville today through a layer of thick fog. Might as well have been landing right smack dab in the middle of the Big 12, or for that matter, the ACC, because these conference races are a mess. It's great. Don't you love it? It's wonderful. Some would even call it a renaissance season. One, and the scores are not noteworthy, but there were a couple of things that happened in both of those games that we're going to talk about. I'm just going to ignore the frozen screen and move on because uh, I'm tired of talking about it. LSU got it done. I got 14 games to touch on in all. Early best bets, Renaissance Tour reveal for week five. And there are a lot of destinations that we could choose from. But, man, we had a great time in Dallas yesterday. I don't know if I met 100 of you, but it was several, several, several dozen if it wasn't into the triple digits. But we have another hero to crown. And this time, I believe it was at SEC Nation, and to remind you what's on the line, well, I'm about to tell you what's on the line because it's brand new, but to remind you what the challenge has been, it's get our brand national recognition. And you guys have taken to getting to game day early or getting to SEC Nation early, and you've taken your posters and you've done it. We've already, I think, got four or five, and the latest hero that we have to crown, he just came forward a little while ago, is Michael Roche. There's his setup. He got there well ahead of time. You can tell the sun's not even up. If you're watching on, uh, or if you're listening on the podcast, right there behind former Alabama great Roman Harper, there it was, front and center on SEC Nation. And Michael Roche now joins a growing list of late kick heroes. And I think game day's in Athens this weekend. I'm not sure where SEC Nation will be, but I will tell you, I have promised you for the last several shows that we are getting something custom made for you guys. Anyone who's able to pull this off, remember, we are not trying to bombard anyone. We're not trying to, you know, paint our chest and go streaker style on the field. Don't commit any misdemeanors or anything like that. But if we can, in a good, clean way, get it done, you can get it done. And uh, we have something to give you. All five of you tomorrow will be shipped Pate State Chalices of Supremacy. What is that? And actually, it's not even chalices, because the plural of chalice, Colin, as we all know, is chalai. That is a chalice of supremacy. Now, that is from the I, Josh. But really what we have there is we have the Pate State logo custom engraved into a chalice, not a cup. It's not a cup, people. It's solid glass. We could shatter these things like Stone Cold's entrance music. That bad boy is going to anyone who pulls this off. And they are not for sale. We do not give those away anywhere else other than if you pull off the, um, the, old, the old school photo bomb. And five of you have done it so far. I've already been told by like a dozen of you you're going to pull it off this week. We'll see. I think our five can confirm it's a little bit harder than it looks. So uh, I will tell you before the end of the show, A, which best bets we're on this weekend, but B, where the Renaissance Tour is headed. There are so many options. It was one of, one of the tougher weeks, especially in the SEC alone. We got Cincinnati and Notre Dame, too, to pick. So I will tell you all about it at the end of the show. But, man, we got a lot to get to. So let's front load it with a lot of rapid reaction from yesterday. Arkansas, man, oh, man, what a day. 20 to 10, a win over Texas A&M. This was a pleasure to experience. And I mean a real pleasure to experience. Now, I know a lot of us spoke out during the week about how we would much prefer it be in College Station or much prefer it be in Fayetteville, but that is what it is. We don't have any control over that. But what a year to be an Arkansas season ticket holder. You've already had a decade's worth of memories in September to do what you did to Texas and to now do what you did to Texas A&M, and you haven't even flipped that calendar to October. It's barely fall, and you've already pulled that off. That was memorable. I saw a lot of your faces yesterday. I spoke to a lot of you before and in a much more jubilant fashion afterwards. 
But what a memorable scene post-game. I'm going to tell you about that in just a second. It was so great to witness. I know a lot of you saw some of the footage I posted on the social channels, at Late Kick Josh, by the way. A lot of extra stuff there that you're not going to see on the show. But what a padlock stat. Sometimes the padlock stats are really complicated. Sometimes you got to dive in. It's, it's something per yards or something per game. Here's the padlock stat. Arkansas led this game 17 to nothing in the first quarter. The end. That was the padlock stat. Because as it turns out, the game was already over at that point. We just didn't know it quite yet. Sometimes scoring margins are kind of relative. Back in the old school Big 12 days, you could be up three touchdowns, and it felt like it was still a seesaw, back and forth affair. This game yesterday, especially if you were watching into the second half, got down to a one possession game. And as I was telling Director Colin, I was on the sideline for this whole game. It felt like in the building, much to the credit of the A&M fans, it felt like they were trying as best they could to grab the throat of that old momentum. And they tried, but to no avail. It never felt like it swung. And that's rare. It's rare because Arkansas hasn't been there before. But Arkansas has a been there, done that quality about themselves, even though a lot of these folks have not been there before, which is impressive. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. But it cannot be overstated. The only thing fluky was the final score. If you watched the rest of college football yesterday, you saw a lot of final scores that were not indicative, and you saw a lot of teams that lost even though they outgained them or they had a, a better yards per play edge. They had more explosive plays. Maybe they just turned the ball over a lot. That was not the case here. Arkansas, if you were to just read a box score, probably runs it up even more than they did on Texas A&M. They missed a chance at points near halftime. Yet K.J. Jefferson, their starting quarterback in and out of the game, uh, early portions of the second half, and yet they, they still never relinquished control of the game. Big credit to them because, again, that's the kind of spot that a lesser team and probably a younger team that is new to that environment, new to that stage, sort of gets – a little jelly-legged in. Maybe they don't lose it, but at the very least, you throw them in a blender for a little while. But I'll tell you the best part is they won with a different style. Because if I'm telling you that you're beating Texas A&M by double digits, you probably think that that coincides with an Arkansas rushing performance of two and a quarter, two and a half, maybe even 300 yards. And that really wasn't the case. They had big plays from Traylon Burks. I think he had six catches over 160 yards. A.J. Green. It was all about explosive plays through the air for Arkansas early. Now, where have we said that before? Very rarely. I think they're going to need it again this week against Georgia. But Ridgeway had a big game. Trey Williams, I was standing next to, a, I was standing next to an A&M staffer who I think three times over the span of one drive said, who's 55? Who is that? Trey Williams, that's who that is. They killed it. Arkansas just killed it on the transfer portal market. I mean, a lot of those guys, for instance, on the defensive line, who you see starting, Trey Williams, chief among them, transfers. So they got it done there. And now we get to look ahead. But first, I want to talk about AM for just a second. Then I'm going to talk about Arkansas some more. I know that there is a lot of reaction out there today that is sweeping in nature. And oh, you got to overhaul everything. Oh, we got to burn it down and we got to build from scratch here and from scratch there. I don't think it's overly complicated, guys. They don't have a quarterback, you know, because the one they were going to be rolling with got hurt. Sometimes it's as cut and dry as that. Offensive line is an issue for them. And so even when Zach Calzada has time, he doesn't think he has time, but you got backup quarterback, you got banged up offensive line, banged up receiver core. And the reason we on this show picked Arkansas to win the game outright was because of just that. There was no quarterback edge for the favorite here. If anything, the quarterback edge was in the side of Arkansas. And we thought that before the game. Certainly everyone thinks that now. But the second part is the most important part. Which program looked like they were playing with the more well-recognizable identity? A&M doesn't have an offensive identity. You can have a play sheet a mile long. Jimbo Fisher can flip through a phone book over there if he wants to. There is no offensive set that accounts for quarterback not being able to stand in the pocket, O-line not being able to establish pocket. There's nothing he can do. You can call all you want. There's nothing he can do. Meanwhile, Arkansas just goes on their merry way and they look like they're in complete control. So I don't think there's any need to overhaul anything. I just think it is what it is at some point with Texas A&M. This is a quote, by the way, from Jeff Tarpley, who runs our, our Texas A&M 24-7 site. I think this summarized things very well. At one point yesterday, Texas A&M was playing four true or redshirt freshmen and had only three players in the same spots as they played in the Orange Bowl. That was just this past year. You've also got a backup quarterback who's being asked to carry the load on offense. 
Juxtapose that to the comments Jimbo Fisher had in his post-game setting. Someone asked him, how much better does Arkansas look? And he said, look like the same players I've been facing since I've been here. And he's dead on the money accurate. And that is what made the post-game scene so memorable. Jimbo's right. A lot of these guys have been there since basically he got to Texas A&M. A lot of these guys are 22, 23 years old. There were tears on that field yesterday. There was a massive outpouring of emotion. And you want to know why? Because it means something. And it has nothing to do with the playoff. And it has nothing to do with the postseason. It has to do with the fact that a lot of these same folks, support staff, coaching staff in some cases, players especially, players most of all, experience things like having Western Kentucky drum you in your own building. Those guys remember that. And so no one really cared who they were going to play next week after this game yesterday. No one really cared about anything other than that moment. Again, that's what college football is about. It's about Saturdays. It's not about two or three weeks down the road. It's not about two or three months down the road. No one cared. And it was really a pleasure to be around it. No one was in a hurry to leave the field. There was family all around the place. There were hugs. Again, a lot of tears. And you may watch that if you are a fan of, let's say, the New England Patriots or the Seattle Seahawks. And you may say, it's a regular season game. Yep, it's a regular season game. That's exactly what it is. And if you don't get it, that's okay. Maybe this sport's not for you. But for those who do get it, you understand exactly why that scene would be the way it is. Nine years is a long time. And that's how long it had been since they uh, beat those guys from College Station. But I'll tell you what stood out the most to me is around the halfway point of this game, or as you may know at halftime, with these teams that are newer to the head table, I like to observe them sometimes in the way they carry themselves. And let me tell you what happens most of the time. And this doesn't necessarily mean anything in and of itself, but a lot of times if a team is achieving something that they've been told they're not supposed to achieve, i.e. an underdog has an early lead, I'll go up a tunnel if I can. And in this case, Jerry Jones has an entire zip code to himself. So I go up Arkansas's tunnel, and I watch them come off the field after the first half. And they look like Alabama. They carried themselves like Alabama. They carried themselves like a team that had been there before. And they haven't. It's very, it was very impressive. Because most of the time what you have is you got players bouncing off the walls and you got everyone jacked up, and that's fine. you got every reason to be, which makes it all the more impressive when you look so subdued, like you're about halfway through a mission, and I, all right, I'm going to go to the kitchen, get something, I'll be right back, and then I'll just press play and we'll continue the movie. And that's exactly what they did. Arkansas hit pause for a second, and then they went back out there, and things went haywire, and yet they never relinquished control of the game. Hats off to Sam Pittman. Hats off to Arkansas. Met so many of you yesterday. A lot of Arkansas staffers came up and said some things to me after the game. Uh, but it all revolves around how special the moment is for the organization, especially for the folks who have been there and experienced the down times. The good times for a true freshman, they don't even know how good they are. You could tell yesterday, based on facial expression, the folks that have been there for a long time versus the folks who were kind of new to the whole process, because the ones who had been there for a long time were looking up all over the place. Some of them had, you know, tear streams down their face. And the true freshmen, they just had saucer eyes. But it was great to see. It was great to be around. Arkansas at Georgia, Saturday. College game day in the house. How about that? I walked for a while yesterday. I had to do a live hit for CBS Sports HQ at 10 a.m., I guess 11 a.m. Eastern, and that left a lot of free time between then and kickoff. So uh, myself and, and Big Game Day, who was there with me, by the way, shout out to him. We, um, you know, we just kind of walked around, saw the tailgating scene. There were tents all over the place. And so many of them, Colin, said Academy on the side. We had people at the restaurant we went to talk about not late kick. I mean, they talked about that too, but they said, went to Academy Sports this week. I had people DMing me yesterday morning while they were on their way to a tailgate scene, showing me their Academy receipts. All this is being passed on, by the way. Thank you so much for that. So it seems that we have figured it out around here. As an audience, as a late kick family, we figured it out. If it's a tent you need, Academy's the spot. If it's a grill you need, Academy Sports and Outdoors is the spot. Now, here's what's exciting for me. It was that time of decade this week. I found myself in need of new clothing. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it'll only make me feel like a banker or some hotshot CEO, neither of which I am, clearly. But I went to Academy.com. Shockingly easy. And I paid cold, hard cash just like you guys do. They don't have a card in my back pocket yet. 
that's a clearing of the throat that's very conveniently timed. But academy.com, very easy. So if you don't live near an Academy Sports and Outdoors, that's fine. Just hit up the website. But there are a lot of great tailgating scenes coming. Colin was pulling up the next two weeks games. I mean, have you guys looked at this? We're going to talk more about it Tuesday, obviously. This weekend and then next weekend, you can make an entire season out of those two weekends. I am telling you, I know at least one of you already is being forced drug to a wedding. Get out of it. Get out. It's not too late. You have plenty of weddings to go to down the road. You won't have many weekends like this. So that's my advice. Get out by any means necessary. And then head to Academy Sports and Outdoors because they got stuff you actually need as opposed to a fall Saturday wedding. I just threw up in my mouth a little bit, Colin. All right, let's move on. Uh, oh, my goodness. I thought I had this later in the show, but I don't. Okay, let me clear my eyes. So we have to talk about what's happening at Clemson because they lost to NC State yesterday as a 10-point favorite. 27-21 to 21 is the final. And I don't know if these are padlock stats 100% of the time, but, boy, it's close. Prepare yourself. If you have children watching, you may want to escort them from the room. Uh, NC State had 31 first downs to Clemson's 10. NC State ran 96 plays in this game. Clemson ran 49. So I had stats and info run the numbers. It turns out that the Wolfpack ran 47 more plays than did the Clemson Tigers. On what planet did we see that happening? Not this one, I can assure you. Oh, here's some more violence. Uh, total yardage, 386 to 214. Time of possession, which is a stat I just throw out to annoy the actual stat crowd. 42 minutes to 18 minutes. It was a bloodbath. It was ugly. It really wasn't even as close as the final score indicated. It, it's, it's horrific right now to watch Clemson try and operate offensively. Congratulations to NC State. And I'm saying this now because a majority of this time is going to be spent on Clemson. But congratulations to NC State. They got off the mat after losing to Mississippi State. That was a game that was full of turnovers. Uh, they rectified the situation. They ambushed Clemson. Shouldn't have been an ambush. Everyone knew it was coming, at least the environment. But there was no answer from the Tigers yesterday. Got that thing to overtime, but ended up falling short. Guys, this was clear after week one. Some of the stuff that's been happening around college football has been really chaotic and been really unpredictable. I don't think this fits that description at all. Remember, on this show at least, when we came out of that Georgia game against Clemson in Charlotte, the big talking point for a lot of people was, how will the college football playoff committee handle a one-loss Clemson? And do you remember the response on this show? It was really succinct. It was really to the point. And it was essentially asking, why do we assume they're done losing? We didn't think they were done losing. There were terminal flaws with the team that were on display. It wasn't, it wasn't like the offensive line was all of a sudden going to rectify itself. It wasn't like speed was all of a sudden going to magically appear at the wide receiver position. Those things are gone for this year, and they're not coming back. And now, uh, the b very bad news, as the show was about to go on the air earlier, Brian Brzee out for the season, torn ACL. So they're down their top two defensive tackles. It's not going to get any easier. I have not gotten an update on Will Shipley. It does not look good for him either. That's a guy that we were very much looking forward to watching this year. But now, just as sure as the sun rose this morning, I flip through various stations as I'm sitting in an airport terminal, and I see the question. I couldn't believe it. And the question is, theoretically, how would the playoff committee handle a two-loss Clemson? They're not done losing. Has anybody watched this? They're not done losing games, guys. Forget about the playoff. In fact, that should be a general rule of thumb for us all in September. Forget about the playoff. But with Clemson, forget about the playoff. Uh, there are much bigger issues to solve here. you got to be thinking 2022. If you guys want to talk playoff, be my guest. You better be talking about 2022 with this team. I have never heard a more defeated head coach than Dabo Swinney after this game yesterday. I know most of you probably have not listened to his postgame press conference, but if you have a little sadistic side of you, I do it because it's my job, but if you have a little sadistic side of you, go listen. He sounds so somber because he knows there's no answer. For this particular team this year, there's no answer. They'll give it all they got. I don't doubt they'll keep fighting. They fought yesterday. They're just not good enough. Uh, that's something you rarely say about a team this talented, but they're just not good enough. Which brings me back to a phrase that we have used several times on this show. We talked about it in the preseason about Clemson. And it is consequences of success. Only a few programs get the privilege of suffering the consequences 
of success. But Clemson's one of them now. They're still relatively new to this. But this is why any talk about comparing anyone to Nick Saban in this sport is always so laughable. And I know Dabo didn't do it himself, but there were some foolish people out there a couple of years ago, because Clemson had beaten them twice, that started to throw out the, well, head coach power rankings. Don't we have to put Dabo ahead of Nick Saban? Well, no, you don't, because they haven't even made it through the first cycle of success yet. Now they found out about the cycle, or they're finding out. That's not past tense. That's present tense. They're finding out about the cycle. There is so much crap that falls in your lap that only happens when you've been to the mountaintop. You can't even imagine it. I've listened to people talk about it before. You don't even have to be a college football coach. You could be running, for all I care, you could be running a, a bottler distributor. When you've made it to the top, there are things you have to handle and things you have to manage that you're ill-equipped to manage because you've never been there before, and you don't know what to do. Dabo Swinney doesn't know what to do right now. He would never say that publicly, but I'm telling you, there was a lost look in his eye, and there's a lost look in this program's eyes right now. Now, you talk to Clemson fans, because I talked to several of them today on my flight home, and there was some brutal honesty. I think there's a recognition if they look in the mirror up there. Now, they're not going to listen to outsiders say it, and that's all well and good. I get it. But, but internally, one Clemson fan to another, I think you guys are looking at your coaching staff, and you're saying, we're not good enough. And you're not, especially offensively. You're not good enough. Uh, you're looking, and this is where rubber is going to meet the road with Dabo Swinney, you're looking at the standards and practices that go into the way he chooses to run the Clemson program. You're never going to hear me doubt the culture they've built up there. It is phenomenal. They've got a process. It works. But the thing about the process is the best organizations, they do have established culture. But they've got culture and they've got flow. And by flow, I mean circulation. You've got to have a steady stream of new people and ideas and uh, adjustments, approaches. Notice I didn't say philosophy. You're not changing the core philosophy. It got you there. You keep that. You keep the Christmas tree. But you better trim it. You better change some ornaments here and there. The sport never sits still. As long as the sport is not going to sit still, you cannot sit still. And when it comes to that whole comparative analysis, fill in the blank versus Nick Saban, Nick Saban has redefined and reconstructed his entire program and never left the pole position over the past decade while he did it. That's what makes him the greatest of all time. He hadn't had the situation. Nick Saban has not lost his season opener and then gone on the road and lost to Mississippi State. That doesn't happen. That never happens with them. That is why that whole conversation I never took part in. It's unfair to compare anyone to him, so I'm not going to spend a majority of the show doing that. I'm just saying I never bought into that and got ridiculed for it because, well, how can you deny that? Well, Dabo just beat him. They did. That made him and that made Clemson the best team in that calendar year. Best coach, best program. That's so much more broad. That's so much more 40, 50,000 feet. So, what are they going to do? I don't know what they're going to do this year, but I'll tell you one thing I am very fascinated to watch about the Clemson Tigers is if Dabo Swinney decides to adjust his approach to the transfer portal because they don't traffic in it right now. They have kids leave because of it, but they don't take transfers. And he talked about that over the summer. He didn't slam the door on it. I think he's smart not to because I think they're going to have to get a little bit more creative because they're very selective in the recruiting process, extremely selective. I think they've got to traffic in the transfer portal. If your competition's doing it, I'm telling you, you've got to have athletes. You don't have athletes to go eight and four, uh, well, at least to the caliber that we're talking about, but you better have them if you want to win championships. Clemson has never won one without them. I'll tell you the other thing to watch. I don't know because I'm not in their locker room, but the one thing that you always have to watch when you've been to the mountaintop, I've said this before, I'll say it one more time. You, um, you watch those Clemson teams in 2015 and 2016, and they were a locker room full of what can I do for Clemson-minded guys. And then guys started coming to Clemson from all over the country, and that's great. That's exactly how I'd run Clemson if I were there. But you cannot help, as long as you have humans coming in, you cannot help but be successful. Guys look at the success, and then they start thinking, what can Clemson do for me? It's natural. It's human nature. You're trying to basically rewire people. And so you never know what that means. You never know what it means in a one-possession game. You never know the difference when you get in the foxhole. You never know what that means for locker room chemistry. You just know that people start talking about that kind of stuff when you've lost games. Well, now they've lost a couple of games. So we'll see where they go because they still got a long road ahead of them. This is by no means done. 
Uh, they may not be done losing this year. All right, let's move it on. Notre Dame yesterday. Anyone see this final score? This is a bizarre situation for me. Here's your end point, Colin. Notre Dame beat Wisconsin yesterday, so that much we know. Uh, 41-13 is what a lot of you didn't know. If you were like me and you were like, kind of trying to keep eyes on the game, but I'm at another game, I looked at that screen early fourth quarter, and Wisconsin was ahead 13-10. to Yes, people, Notre Dame in a game they won 41-13, to trailed 13-10 to in the fourth quarter. So how does that happen? Uh, well, uh, it went from a situation where I told a buddy they could play to Wednesday and not score 35 to Notre Dame getting 31 in the fourth quarter alone. They had 21 non-offensive points in the fourth quarter. That's how it happened, by the way. Graham Mertz, quarterback for Wisconsin. A lot of you chanted for him. Uh, to be blunt, a lot of folks in Wisconsin acted the same way. Well, not quite to this degree, but they had the same mentality that a lot of our brethren in Oklahoma do today. They wanted the backup. Well, they got him. They got him. And now, uh, four more interceptions and a lost fumble yesterday later, they've got a second loss on their plate, where, again, it looks in a box score like they outplayed an opponent just like it looked in week one against Penn State, and yet you go to that turnover margin, and boom, there goes the game because you can't give the other team the ball multiple times in what is already going to be a competitive environment and expect to win. And so it turns out that Paul Chris knew what he was doing all along, shocking though it may be, when he was running Jack Cohn out there. So um, you don't have to pay the price for that, is my point. He does. You don't have to sit there and answer questions about it. He does. That's why head coaches are a lot more deliberate with those position changes. That's why Lincoln Riley is a lot more deliberate with how he's handling Caleb Williams and Spencer Rattler. I'll talk about that in due time. Don't worry. But this was a classic misleading final. I'm always careful when I talk like this because people hear what you don't say. Uh, Notre Dame deserves to win the game. You can't take the game away from them. It's a big win for Brian Kelly. They found a way. Again, they're still undefeated. Great for Notre Dame. Fight on, fight on, fight on, etc. But if you want to know how misleading the final is being interpreted as, let me read you this week's odds. Notre Dame 41-13. Keep that in mind. Cincinnati has opened as a favorite at Notre Dame this Saturday. Wisconsin is favored against Michigan this Saturday. So you think to yourself, Wisconsin just got blown out. Michigan's undefeated, certainly. They're not going to be favored over them. Yeah, they are. If you got a turnover-filled result, yeah, they are. Vegas doesn't care. I tried to teach you all about turnovers. Vegas doesn't care about them. They don't view that as any more predictive than a tarot card reading. They do not care. They will keep throwing that stuff out all day long. Notre Dame, though, playing host to Cincinnati. That's a Super Bowl for one team. I don't know how the Irish are treating it. That's a Super Bowl for one team. Hey, Marcus Freeman, though, let me say something positive now. Marcus Freeman was, uh, to me, the biggest assistant coach hire in the offseason. The what, Colin? The summer. And he's at Notre Dame. He is the defensive coordinator there by way of Cincinnati. They have been lighting it on fire. I think they are something like 5 of 30 on third downs. That's what they have held their last two opponents to. 5 of 30 on third down. That will win you a lot of ball games. So you can look at these results and you can say, oh, Notre Dame's just buying time right now. They'll eventually get their offense right. I would be one to believe in that and buy into it. I just don't know what the maximum potential here is, even with a healthy Jack Cohn. I don't know what the maximum potential is because their offensive line's not good. It's just not good right now. And he does not have time to operate. And here's the shame. The shame is you look in the backfield, you look at wide receiver, you look at tight end, there are weapons on this team that are going to waste at the moment because there's not enough time to really utilize them, and it's a shame. I don't know how much they can rectify there over the course of the rest of the year, but Notre Dame is undefeated. So by no means should anyone out there be frowning, because you could be in Florida State's position. You know, you could be in a position where uh, that, those roles are reversed and that 4-0 and is turned upside down. Don't want that. But Cincinnati is on deck for Notre Dame. Michigan is on deck for Wisconsin. Part of a loaded weekend in college football coming up. I mean loaded. Oh, imagine having plans Saturday. Couldn't be me, Colin. Couldn't be me. Okay, I've got so many more games to get to. We're going rapid fire here. Let's head down to the SEC. Several more takeaways here. LSU got it done. I mean, hats off. They got it done. This stuff's not easy. It is not easy to win football games on the road. LSU was up 28 to 10 comfortably. They held on at Mississippi State to win 28 to 25. This is a game that's probably going to be forgotten. 
a little ways down the road. Don't forget it. I don't know how the rest of the season is going to play out for LSU, but had they lost this game, it was going to be really bad down there. I mean, like, changes coming inevitably bad. And they won the game. So because they won it, everyone will forget. I don't forget that kind of stuff. Because I remember what we were saying going into the weekend, and I meant every word of it. So big win. Hats off to Ed Orgeron. Hats off to his staff. It was not an easy place to play by any stretch. But 28-10 became 28-25 to really quickly there in the fourth quarter. They have some things to correct. But, man, our assessment on this game was spot on. Really proud of the way the model responded. Uh, they had a three-point – we had a three-point LSU win. LSU wins by three. And um, I remember talking about the game last week. And the reason there was so much trepidation in my voice about picking LSU is because I knew I couldn't count on their run game. And that was dead on the money. At no point this year will you be able to count on LSU running the ball. Yesterday, 27 times they tried to run it. They put 63 yards up. That is uh, abysmal. That is an abysmal rushing performance. And it was up to Max Johnson, and it was up to their defense, and they got it done. And there are, there are portions of that defense that are improving. So, again, give credit where it's due. Give Max Johnson credit where it's due. Uh, Mississippi State outrushed them. That's not necessarily something I thought I was going to be saying, but it's an LSU win, and that's all that counts right now. So they survive, and they go back home to face Auburn. Now, here's something to keep in mind for this week. LSU won the game but their defense was on the field 88 plays. Auburn is in wounded animal mode. They got their pride tested this past weekend. They already came off a loss. They almost got beat by Georgia Southern or Georgia State. Some of you would argue they did. Kind of an Arkansas circa 2020 protocol there at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Uh, far be it for me to question the SEC officiating crews, though. But now Auburn's going to go on the road, and that's a team that also LSU's not going to be able to run the ball on. And so LSU, unless they have a very efficient passing attack, you're going to have some short series that put your defense back out on the field, and that 88 plays defensed the week before could come into play Saturday. Keep an eye on that. Tennessee pushed Florida for a little while, but in the end it was Florida 38, Tennessee 14. The Xbox crowd was loud during this game, very loud. And here's what the Xbox crowd said. The Xbox crowd looked at Tennessee and Florida, and they said, oh, it's a three-point game. It's halftime. What's wrong with Florida? Nothing is wrong with Florida. It's not Xbox, friend. These are real humans that are seven days removed from playing the University of Alabama. Do you know what that does to most teams? Do you know what most teams look like the week after they play Bama? So let me get this straight. You're leading a team that is clearly putting everything and then some they have in the barrel into taking you down. Remember the LSU game last year, for reference, if you've forgotten. And then you pull away in the second half. The Xbox crowd has no clue these games last four quarters, by the way. And so in the end, it's 38-14. to 14. Florida pitches a shutout in the second half. It's not easy to shut out this Tennessee offense. It may be not the biggest challenge in the world to beat the team. It's not easy to shut them out. And Florida did that. Emory Jones, I think, played the best game of his season. Uh, his play continues to get better. The offensive line paved the way for well over 300 and I think 30 some odd yards rushing. So it was a really good performance. I mean, I looked at it and then I compared it to what some of my Florida buddies were saying about the game. I thought we watched two different games. No, it wasn't perfect. No one plays perfect ever, much less the week after they almost beat Bama. Like, do you, do you know what this should have looked like? This should have looked like you chewing your nails to the nub, sweating out a last minute victory. That's really what it should have looked like. And instead you ran away. Good for Florida. They're headed to Kentucky this week. Lined open around a touchdown. It's up to eight and a half right now. Gators favored in Lexington. Game on. Part of a loaded slate this week in the SEC. Oh, this is going to get somber really quick. Oh, boy. All right. Well, I got chewed out because I didn't talk Georgia on the show last week. So, uh, quick recap of last week. Georgia beat South Carolina. Well, let's talk about it. I've got one of the more violent stats I will ever read to you. Georgia 62, Vandy nothing. That's not even the violent stat. That's just the score. The model loved Georgia in this game. On our Friday Night Lines Instagram live chat, I told you guys, one of you asked, what do you think about the Georgia game? I said, I'm not touching this. But I will tell you, the model, one of the strongest leans of the entire week was Georgia minus 35 and a half. I just don't lay Five touchdowns in conference games. It just doesn't make sense to me. And then Georgia proceeded to cover in one quarter. And so I said, well, good for Georgia. Now, I stopped watching after that. I had other things to attend to. 
but uh, it got way worse. So Vandy had 77 total yards of offense in this game. They didn't get close to triple digits. Let me tell you how bad this was. Are you ready for this? Now, I want whatever you're doing to just stop for a second. Because I'm going to read something. And if you just let it blend in with all the other words coming out of my mouth, you may not realize what I've just said. So let's pause. Whatever you're doing, stop washing the dishes. Turn the radio down. Listen to this. This is a conference game, by the way. Georgia had more guys run for a touchdown than Vanderbilt had first downs. Let's pause. Let's let it sizzle. In an SEC football game, Georgia had more players run for a touchdown than Vandy had total first downs. For the record, that is a 5-4. to four. Vandy had four first downs the entire game. So much for home field advantage. Uh, they, being Georgia, they welcome in Arkansas Saturday. 19.5 point favorites right now. A lot of you out there are looking at these Bama and Georgia spreads. Really excited to take those points. Okay. What do we have in here? Do we have someone who needs to get banned? Yes, we do. Put user in timeout. I'll police the chat if no one else will. How about Alabama 63, Southern Miss 14? Anyone take away anything from this? Probably not. You probably didn't watch the game. Alabama, in case you haven't noticed, has used an Ohio State transfer receiver better than Ohio State's using their own receivers that this guy presumably left because of, because he couldn't get on the field enough. So Jamison Williams is a racehorse. He runs like a 3940. Uh, he's insane to watch. Several times last night, these poor kids from Southern Miss had decent angles. Uh, I mean, trying really hard, and it just looked like a carnival game. It looked like the rims were way too tight. There was no way they were going to make the shot. So Jamison Williams does what, if you're watching on YouTube, he's doing here right now. Uh, ugly. Okay, well, I can't watch this. The parents of some of those players may be watching. But, man, how about Jaleel Billingsley? The sudden reemergence. It's like Toby Flanderson coming back from Costa Rica. Jaleel Billingsley has made a sudden and mysterious reappearance. The only difference is Bama fans are not distraught. They are very happy to see him back. And Nick Saban just kind of ho-humming his way through the first month of the season. We play a top 20 team to open. I'll probably use it to teach a player a lesson. Well, Jaleel Billingsley's back now. And Cam Latu's been filling in very well, too. So they got two legitimate receiver options. Cam Latu's a former linebacker, by the way. They just repurposed. And so now Alabama welcomes in Ole Miss. And Alabama opened as a big favorite. They opened at 20 at Circa. No, none of you got down money on Ole Miss plus 20. Don't lie and say you did. But even now, Ole Miss is available plus 15 and a half, 16, something like that. You going to go for it? We're going to predict the game Tuesday. I'm not telling you anything right now. You going to go for it? Be my guest. Uh, how about Kentucky? Kentucky was minus three turnovers, and they still beat South Carolina in williams Bryce Stadium, 16 to 10. It is hard to comprehend what I'm about to tell you. How about South Carolina? You're at home in a night game. You are plus three turnovers, and you have three drives start in plus territory, and you hang 10 on the board, a 10 spot. Could have done better. Uh, would hope that they would do better, but they did not. It's also hard to comprehend that Kentucky is 4-0, despite the fact that they're minus nine in turnovers on the year. None of this makes sense. None of what I just said makes sense. But yet, that's where we are. And so Kentucky has found their way, despite, again, turnover margins that indicate they shouldn't be finding their way, and they've bought themselves time. And each week, you get a little bit more install, you get a little bit more gelling and rhythm together, and now their biggest test of the season so far arrives Saturday when the Kentucky Wildcats welcome in the Florida Gators. If you want to see stuff really get turned on its ear, have Kentucky beat Florida Saturday. Because that would be, that'd be the first really big one down here. Have them beat Florida Saturday, and then we can start talking about the SEC East upheaval. That's not a prediction. That was just a mere statement. All right, lastly, I wanted to go around the rest of the country. Yeah, as you guys know, I can see in the chat, there's a lot we haven't talked about yet. It's coming. Right now, probably. Oklahoma. What's happening in Norman? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. A 4-0 team, 16-13. They beat West Virginia yesterday. I, stop torturing yourselves. Stop that. You're holding yourselves to a standard that you developed based on preseason culture and preseason magazine, preview magazine culture, and you are not that right now. The Oklahoma Sooners are not what preview magazine season told you they would be. Spencer Rattler is not what preview magazine season told you he would be. It's okay. I mean, it's still 4-0. Again, could be a lot worse out there. Now, are they perfect? No. I got 47 flaws I could point out right now. Uh, they cannot run the ball. Two yards per carry last night. Offensive line, 
well below Oklahoma standards. You got the student section asking for the backup quarterback in less than friendly terms to be inserted. Let me address that, by the way. If you didn't see it last night, it was crazy. Uh, hats off to the crew there at ABC. I think Fowler and, and Kirk Herbstreet just flat out said, uh, in case you guys can't hear this, they're chanting, we want Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams was the top quarterback in the country last year. He is the backup, as of uh, this hour, to Spencer Rattler, your preseason Heisman favorite. Yours, not mine. We didn't necessarily like that all that much here. What do I think about the fans booing? I got asked that a lot. What did I think about the fans chanting for uh, Caleb Williams? Well, a couple of things can be true, to be honest with you. And I'm not endorsing the first thing that's about to come out of my mouth. Please understand. It's just, theoretically, these two things could be true. It could be true that Caleb Williams gives you a better chance to win. I don't think that. Because if I did, I think Lincoln Riley would have him in the game. But just, I'll humor you, that could be true. It still, under no circumstance, makes it acceptable or even smart to chant it at a home game. Do you understand you have recruits in the building? This was a big recruiting weekend for Oklahoma. Me and Wolfong spent like 10 minutes talking about this on Whip Around last week. Do you know what I would do to this morning if I were a rival coach and I was recruiting against Oklahoma? I would say, hey, at one time, Spencer Rattler was you. He was sitting in those stands. They were wooing him. All those fans wanted him there. They're 4-0. and And look at They're treating him like trash. Do you want to go there? We never do that. You can go watch all our tape. Our fans have never chanted for backups. They never booed our players. And in most cases, that's true. Like, what are you guys doing? I understand the frustration. I have told you, I think Rattler is overhyped as a quarterback. I don't think the guy is an alpha leader by any stretch of the imagination. We have been very blunt about our assessment of Spencer Rattler. Having said that, it's ludicrous to handle it like that. It's just stupid. It's stupid to do it. You don't help anything. I can tell you right now, Lincoln Riley probably takes a step back and is less inclined to put the back up in. The last thing any head coach wants is an announcer to say, well, the fans chanted for it, and now Lincoln has given it to him. Here comes Caleb Williams. The second Caleb Williams gives Oklahoma the best chance to win a football game will be the second you see Caleb Williams in the football game. What you don't want is a Graham Mertz 2.0 where you got Caleb Williams in there. He's showing you flashes. Oh, there's an interception. Showing you more flashes, a couple of more turnovers. Because guess what you can't do after that? You can't turn back to Spencer Rattler. He's probably long since thrown up the deuces. He's gone. Can't do that. So let's just be careful here. Still 4-0. You never know. With teams as talented as Oklahoma, stranger things have happened in the past. You could find a groove. You could find another gear. They got Texas in two weeks, by the way. Could very well be a renaissance tour destination. Uh, Texas, speaking of the horns... Did they stop scoring yet? 70 to 35 was the final yesterday. Texas over Texas Tech. The big question is can the Red Raiders play defense? I'm happy to report we have an answer. Nope, they cannot. These stats are impressive, depending on one perspective, or alarming, depending on the other. Casey Thompson has led Texas to points on 20 of his last 23 drives. That includes 19 touchdowns in his last 23 drives. Now, it was against Food, Rice, and Texas Tech. I don't care if you did it against Air. That's pretty impressive. That was by uh, Chip Brown, by the way. He looked that up. I did not look that up today. I didn't have time. Over at Horns 24-7. Uh, so, yes, in Casey, we trust. Certainly, that's the mood tracker. We have not updated it out in Austin. They have not attempted a punt in like two weeks. They didn't even attempt to punt yesterday. 336 yards on the ground, too. This was not a whole bunch of points where it's just bomb away, bomb away, bomb away. They did enough of that. They could have run all the way to Lubbock if they wanted to yesterday. Texas is a four-point favorite this week against Texas Christian. TCU is in a bad way. They lost on rest yesterday uh, to the hand, well, at the hands of SMU, the old skillet game out there. Texas is either going to win that thing by three touchdowns or get upset this week. And I'm not quite sure which one it is, but that four I don't think will be a consequential number. I think it's just kind of an aggregation of all the model runs. But, yeah, it's going to be a wild variation in final out there. But Texas, two weeks away from Red River, and they are squarely in the Big 12 championship race, obviously. They got TCU Saturday. Baylor beat a team from Ames, Iowa that I used to call Iowa State, but I don't recognize the play as of late. Am I upset about it? Yeah, very upset about it. 
because I keep looking and I keep saying, well, let's see, Iowa State, 469 to 282, outgained them big time. Iowa State, let's see, 263 through the air, 216 on the ground, really good day. Uh-oh, special teams issues again. Uh-oh, coverage unit bad again. This was what cost Iowa State down the stretch last year in the Big 12 championship game. It cost him, and it cost him again. And now Baylor beats him 31-29. to Iowa State, uh, we're not even talking postseason at this point. It is important to note that the Big 12 could end up being a mess. Baylor is 4-0, so Baylor is obviously uh, still perfect. I think that when you have one conference loss, obviously you still consider yourself in that conference race. I don't know that anyone's going undefeated out here. I don't know that for the conference purposes, you're going to have a situation where it's very clear cut until the very end. And so hang on, just hang on for one more. Wilson Phillips, we got to go Wilson Phillips mode. That's the new mood tracker. Hold on for one more day at Iowa State or one more game. Uh, But in the meantime, some higher levels of execution would be nice. Georgia Tech, happy times. Happy times on the flats. Georgia Tech 45, North Carolina 22. We do have a padlock stat in this game. And here it is. The padlock stat is North Carolina had 1.8 yards per carry yesterday. That's not going to get it done. Now, that's disappointing because we looked at their run game at the beginning of the year, and I thought with the additions they made in the portal, Ty Chandler and whatnot, I thought they would be able to perform a lot better than they have. They haven't. But there is good news on the other side, and that is Jeff Sims. Welcome back, Jeff Sims. How about 10 of 13 through the air, 112 yards, 10 runs for 128 on the ground, three touchdowns, Jeff Sims. Once again, QB1 there at Georgia Tech. The turn did not happen this week. I was uh, talking to some people with Georgia Tech this past week, and it was about that very thing. They were coming off, remember, the close loss against Clemson. And no one's ready to acknowledge that you've turned a corner until you win a game. Well, there was a feeling there that they'd already turned the corner. They happened to lose a game last week, but they have seen some of those internal telltale signs that make them believe they've turned a corner. I share that opinion. I'm not sitting here telling you, watch out, they'll probably meet you in Charlotte in a couple of months, but I am telling you, whatever the low point was for Georgia Tech football, I think it's in the rearview mirror. And I think that as a program, they are trending up now. This is a huge win for them, a huge win. It is a build-on win. And so congratulations to Jeff Collins and company. I don't think they're done making noise this season. Michigan won one of the more boring games in the history of college football yesterday. 20-13 to 13 was the final. Classic survive in advance mode. Uh, that's about all you can say about it. However, if you told me Michigan was only going to have 112 yards on the ground, I would have thought upset. And it was 20-13. to 13. The spread here was nearly three touchdowns. So Rutgers did cover. They outscored Michigan 10-zip in the second half. And yet still, Michigan found a way. So I'll credit him for that. Uh, If anything, it makes me respect Rutgers a little bit more. But this week, Rutgers welcomes in Ohio State. They got a shot there, obviously. I mean, they got a shot to do something that you don't expect them to do. But Michigan, undefeated Michigan, this doesn't make sense to a lot of you. Michigan is going to Wisconsin, and Wisconsin's favored in the game. And again, I think a lot of folks are going to jump on Michigan. That's fine. Just be careful. Turnovers are not always forward-thinking in nature. So just be careful there. Uh, The last two I wanted to hit on, Michigan State beat Nebraska. A lot of you may not care about this. 23-20 to in overtime. This is a very big win because it was such a huge letdown spot for a program that's not established yet. Michigan State just thrashed Miami last week. So this is a game that you would expect a less experienced, you know, less together established product to come home and, and flop in. And they, they didn't play perfectly by any stretch, but the line was only five on the game. And Michigan State ends up winning 23-20 in overtime. A huge loss on paper. This is a game they absolutely should lose. Listen to this. 28-12, to they lost the first down edge. Uh, they were outgained by nearly 200, but they had a punt return late. The hidden yardage factor came into play, and then they won the game. They, the Michigan State Spartans, are still perfect. And lastly, I don't have much to say about it, But Oregon State thrashed Southern Cal yesterday. And I had like three or four of you ask me to talk about that. Congratulations to Oregon State. Congratulations to the Beavers for thoroughly dismantling Southern Southern Cal. I've spoken my piece on that game. Boy, we got a loaded week coming up. Okay, two things we need to announce right now. The first thing I need to announce, and I don't even know what order I put it in, so we're going to go Renaissance Tour first. 
Last week, we were in Arlington, and that's all well and good, but it was a neutral site location, and you know how much we believe in sticking to on-campus sites. Well, that's not a problem this week, because we've got a plethora, and you know how rarely I use that word, a plethora to choose from. At the beginning of the year, I looked at this week, and I thought for sure, it's got to be Auburn at LSU, right? First chance to get to LSU, and uh, didn't know what to expect from some of these other folks, like Kentucky, didn't know they were going to be undefeated. Ole Miss, didn't quite know they were going to be this caliber. Arkansas, didn't expect that. But yet now, you got Arkansas at Georgia, you got Florida at Kentucky, you got Auburn at LSU, you got Ole Miss at Bama. Oh, by the way, you got Cincinnati at Notre Dame. But if you remember last year, and you remember Alabama not being able to get Ole Miss off the field ever, and having to score 62 to win, and if you have followed Ole Miss this year, and if you understand in the past what's beaten Alabama, there's only one place we can go this week. We are taking the Renaissance Tour to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's our, obviously our first trip to Alabama uh, this season. And uh, very much looking forward to this because I am telling you, Alabama was never going to open as some 10 or 11 point favorite in this game. They were always going to be over two touchdowns. It's just the way this stuff works. But having said that, there's going to be so much love for Ole Miss out there this week. We've got them rated top five. I've been leading the Ole Miss charge. Cannot wait to get down to Tuscaloosa. It's the 3.30 Eastern time CBS game of the week. Uh, plus, you know, it did not help that they made Auburn at LSU a 9 Eastern time kickoff. Woof. Terrible. So uh, we will be in Tuscaloosa Saturday. I know game day is going to be in Athens. That's all well and good. Remember, chalice, chalai of supremacy on the line for anyone who gets the late kick or the Pate State posters in the frame shot. Okay, well, let's go Ramen Noodle Express, and let's get out of here. We went 2-4 and four yesterday. I was really aggravated about it. We're still well above 500 for the season. Uh, well, 12-10, and 10, not well above, but we are above. We got three early best bets here, and all of them, I think, have moved, but not too much. So let's go with Kent State. They are at home versus Bowling Green. A lot of you are scared about this because Bowling Green just beat Minnesota yesterday. We don't care. Uh, Kent State minus 15 and a half. We got food. We are, I'm so excited to bet on Rice because we have not been kind to them, but we hope they're kind to us this week. Rice is at home versus Southern Miss. We're taking Rice minus two and a half. And then a lot of you got nervous about this one too. Just, just trust. Just have faith. Penn State is laying 10 and a half at home against Indiana. Huge revenge spot. And if you've ever followed James Franklin, he is not shy about padding the number late. He is not shy at all about it. And so Penn State minus 10.5 we like, Rice minus 2.5, Kent State minus 15.5. Obviously, there will be several more to come. And we appreciate you tuning in. I'm trying to make sure the live chat is updated. There we go. Okay, we've got a lot to get to this week. I've got a lot more to talk about from my trip to Arlington. I'll probably go a little bit more into detail on Tuesday morning's Late Kick Extra episode. Uh, it's a podcast only Tuesday and Thursday, so make sure you check that out. Also, we've kind of flattened out on the subscriptions to the YouTube channel. We're still getting a couple of hundred a day, but our views that aren't subscribed is still at like 70%. So do us a favor. It's free. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's it. That's all. At Late Kick Josh. Make sure you don't miss these best bets. Instagram, Twitter, at Late Kick Josh. That's about all we got. We are out of here. Have yourselves a great start to the week. For Director Colin, our entire crew in Fort Lauderdale, I'm Josh Pate. Have a great rest of your night, too, and God bless. Best only.